everybody. How many people here love hand-drawn animation? Very good. Good. I have been obsessed with hand-drawn animation ever since I was a kid. I would watch Soul Train just for the animated train in the opening sequence. That was how much I loved hand-drawn animation. I would watch that show because I kept hoping that train would come back. I love hand-drawn animation. And this is some of the stuff that I like to create in Lightwave. I like to make renders that look hand-drawn. We can't hear you. Can't hear. There we go. So, Jen, wait a minute. If you like hand-drawn, why are you in Lightwave? Well, what happened was I was interested in getting into 3D in 1997, and there were so many packages to choose from. But what happened was only one package had a built-in cell shader tool set, and that was Lightwave. The other packages, it was all third-party. Uh, for example, Max, it was the Incredible Comic Shop, and, and other. I think with, with Maya, it was, a, it was a custom plugin, RenderMan plugin for Iron Giant, but Lightwave had cell shading built in. So, and some really good examples too. I saw some incredible cell shade examples coming out of Lightwave back in 1997. So that was it. I decided I have to learn this program. So, okay, so, so just, just for some of those that might not 100% know, when you're talking about cell shade, you're actually talking about a non photoreal way of rendering a 3D object. Yes, it's just one facet of non photorealistic rendering. I mean, I've seen people create non photorealistic re uh, renders out of Lightwave that look like paint, like watercolor. But my obsession is cell animation, the classic Disney, the classic Disney animation, the classic uh, anime, the, like anything that, in the past it used to be actual se sheets of celluloid, then acetate, and now it's all digital ink and paint, like one digital ink and paint guy replaces about 20 guys uh, versus the older methods. But I still just like that look, that graphic look. And in this case, this one's a little bit overboard because there's only one, uh, there's only one traditional animation production I know that actually shaded their inclines, and that was Wonderful Days in 2003. Uh, every, everything else, it's usually been uh, just a solid color. But I'd like to get into the basics of the Lightwave cell shading tool set in terms of the inking, and then I'll, I'll show more practical examples like this one. So this is cool. This, you're actually look, you were looking at VPR there in, in layout, and you're able to... Yes, edges do show up in the interactive uh, renderer engine in Lightwave, which is really nice. So I'm going to switch to VPR. And the first thing that I'd like to tell everybody is that the way that Lightwave inking has worked since 1997 is that it's tracing the wireframe edges on your model. So the more wireframe edges you have, the smoother your ink line will look. The fewer edges you have to trace, the chunkier it's going to look. That's just how it is. So higher res means smoother lines. Yep. And then I'd like to show you the five basic edge types, because the way it works is it's a selective wireframe. And instead, of, instead of shading all possible edges on the surface, it only shades a few. So in this case, here are the five basic edge types. I'm going to turn them all off. So silhouette edges, it represents in life drawing where the, the surface turns away from the viewer. So in this case, the geometry is turning away from me, the camera. I, the camera represents me. So this, if it's a shared edge and a normal face is towards the camera and a norm, normal face is away from the observer, then it qualifies as a silhouette edge. Although, in the case of reflections and refractions, this is going to get a little more complicated. But for right now, I'm just going to stick to the camera rules. But th this is silhouette edges, where the surface turns away from the camera. So I'm noticing there that when you do the silhouette edge, that lower edge doesn't get it because they're, they're what is it? Is it because there's it's a, a rounding? It's an unshared edge. It, it uh, because, because the lower edge does not turn away from the camera, it's visible at all times. It's just that there's no. It's not a shared edge. It belongs to nothing but one polygon. If it only belongs to one polygon in the scene, that edge qualifies as an unshared edge because it's not shared. Uh, sharp creases refers to smoothing angle. You'll notice that up here, the smoothing angle doesn't quite smooth over the surface. That was because I lowered in the surface editor. What I did with this uh, surface was I lowered the smoothing angle to a sharp, to a sharp angle of 15 uh, degrees. 
So you can actually control what qualifies. If it's smoothed over in OpenGL, you can kind of tell what'll appear as a, a, a sharp edge, because if it's, if it's not smoothed over in OpenGL, then that means it's a sharp crease, and it will appear, it will get rendered as such, as a sharp crease. Surface borders is if you have two different surfaces, they could be the same color. It doesn't have to be different colors. It just has to be two different surface names. And then that qualifies as an edge type of its own. And then the last one is every, anything that doesn't fall under any of the above categories would be other edges. And that is anything that doesn't qualify as a silhouette edge, an unshared edge, sharp crease, or surface border. That is everything else. That's everything a catch-all for everything else. There's another uh, a couple of tips while I'm still in here. You'll notice that all of these guys have different colors. And that's because I'm using the node editor. If I didn't use the node editor, they'd all get this edge color here, which could be anything that I want. So let's, uh, let's make it red. Now they're all red. But if I turn this on, the reason that they're, it's overriding the color is because if you go in here, I've got a different color constant plugged in and overriding the silhouette edge color, the unshared edge color, the sharp creases, surface borders, but I don't have other edges overridden. That's why it remains, that's why it's still red. Originally so, it was black. So the edges are actually in the node editor that is throughout the LightWave application. Yes, you can you can manipulate different properties in here, and this only scratches the surface. I'll be getting I'll be getting to more of uh, of that later. I also like to give another tip to people who are dealing with thin edges. If you do an oversampling of 0.7, that can help smooth out the appearance of of thin edges. You'll notice here there's a bit of roughness to it, but when I set the oversampling to 0.7. It helps refine and smooth up the appearance of these edges, so you can get better inking if you use oversampling in your render. This is because what it's doing is it's actually fanning out the rays per pixel to about like a, a value of one would be uh, the rays can fan out to like one pixel outside of the uh, if if the oversampling is set to zero, then all of the rays per pixel can only land within that pixel. If you set it to one, then the rays can not only land in that pixel, but also they can fan out and like bleed into neighboring pixels. This represents a pixel diff a, of, of a distance represented in pixels. So in this case, I'm letting the, the rays bleed 0.7 pixels into their neighbors, and that's what's smoothing out the appearance here. If I only, if they were only allowed to look at individual pixels, they might not see, they might. Things might fall through the cracks. And that's in our aliasing. That's where the, you get that stair-stepping. Yes. Yep. So it's uh, to improve the appearance of fine lines, consider using a little bit of oversampling. So let me close this. So this is getting a little bit more into the node editor. So anything that you can use in the node editor can be used to affect the look of your edges. So in this instance, in this node editor, I've, got, I've defined the base thickness of all of these with uh, right in here, like I'm saying, these silhouette edges are 10 pixels uh, and that the other edges are just one pixel thick and that's why it looks the way it does. When I turn on the node editor, what I'm, well, okay, that does look a little complicated, but it's, it's just uh, All right, so what you're doing though, though, is it without this, without this power, it's just gonna be, a fixed width. Yes. That's it. Just draw me a line. That line is going to be a fixed width, and that's it. But by going into the node editor, now that the node editor has control over seeing and, and dealing with the edges, you have more control over the artistic freedom of how those edges are being drawn. Correct. So in this case, anything, anything you want. And uh, if you taper refers to the thickness of the edge. So anything that gets plugged into taper is going to, uh, if you want, for example, this turbulence texture right now is affecting both sharp creases and surface borders to vary the width. So that's why you've got a bubbly look to this because the texture is, is varying the wet width wherever the texture lands. And the same is, going, is uh, happening here. I'm using this procedural texture to, to vary the width of, of this particular of this particular edge. You can also use weight maps. Weight maps to 
weight maps might be a good choice for silhouette edges so that if you have weight values on the object of 100% up here and 0% up here, then as it approaches 0%, the line tapers to nothing. So I actually see that you're getting like a, a thin to thick, then back to thin as the stroke of the, of the edge goes along that, yep. that border. Another nice option is using incidence angles to vary the thickness on the unshared edges so that as the surface turns away from the camera, these edges get thinner and thinner. So that anything you can think of that you would normally use in surfacing, you can use to control taper, color, and I haven't shown it here, but you can also make these edges fade out by changing their opacity, which might be nice for a sense of wash. So there's a lot of control here in, in, this, in this node editor. And I'm just sort of uh, scratching the surface here. I'd like to give this tip because what you're looking at is a selective wireframe tracing. If, the, if there is no edge, it's, there's nothing to trace. There's nothing to represent. So that's why here there's a missing ink line, or at least visually it seems like a missing ink line. But it's just being very technical. If there is no ink line, it's not going to get, if there is no wireframe edge, it will not get traced because there's nothing for it to trace. On this one, where I boolean to the two, where I boolean the geometry together, there's an edge, there's a wireframe edge for it to trace. So that's pretty important to maintain if you're gonna do like, a, like an illustration and you wanna make sure that the lines are gonna be there. So you have to be very conscious of your model when you, when you build. I always build my models with these rules in mind. If you know the rules, you can accommodate them. That, that's it, and what's great is that for me is that the rules are simple. I can follow these simple rules when I build my models. I like simple. Uh, everyone does, but I'd like to uh, I'd like to pull up since this is a sort of a blank canvas. I'd like to show. I've only got other edges turned on, but I'd like to show an example of using the node editor. I activated the node editor, and this is a blank canvas. Let's add a turbulence texture to this. I'm just going to take its alpha and plug it into other edges taper. And right now it's a one meter size texture, so I guess it's not going to do much. Let's see now. Although maybe I'm doing something wrong. Do, or, oh, I, I'm sorry. I was obscuring. I, I grabbed the wrong object. I was actually affecting this guy. They're two separate objects. My bad, guys. Okay. But I see there you've added a little a little uh, turbulence texture into that edge. Yes. Let me actually change the color of this to something really ugly. I'm gonna use a a green and. Then I'm going to, I'll just make this one red. Actually, let's do that. Right click, left click, done. Now I'm gonna take this ugliness and I'm gonna plug it into other edges color. I'm gonna take the taper off for now so you can see wherever the, the texture appears. That I'm, I'm texture, I'm using a procedural texture on these lines. Would I want to? I don't know. Maybe I would want to use a UV map to paint specific colors onto this texture. But it's there if you need it and using the alpha of the same texture to affect the thickness of the lines, that's what causes the, causes the varied width. So you can, you can do a lot just with, just with a, a procedural texture. If you want to create a, a sense of varied width, it's there. Like you might want, it might create a, a sense of graphite. Let's uh, bump up the frequencies. See what we got. Let's see here. That might be, uh, let me make it thicker. I'm gonna just go out and tell it, I'm gonna make it 20 pixels thick. And maybe I vibrated that too much. So what I'm seeing here really is that you've got an awful lot of new controls over the uh, cell shade or the non-photorealistic render that's built into LightWave. And with a VPR, you have instant feedback. So you can really dial in your, dial in the look that you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. and for and example, you could animate this texture and then you've got the, the weave and the, that you would expect from hand-drawn animate. Well, you know how it is when they, they try to put a little bit of life by drawing the same drawing over and over and then they they cycle between the drawings just so that, it, like Bill Plimpton, like Bill Plimpton's stuff. 
So you've got a lot of options here. Ah, now this one, this one really got special with 11.5. Because if you want your character to reflect in a mirror, or if you want it to refract in a magnifying glass, this is now possible with 11.5 and up. I'm doing this in 11.6. So this is BPR showing me reflection and refraction of edges themselves, which is pretty darn spiffy. I, I like this a lot because it means that I can have a character looking into a mirror. It means that I could have uh, Sherlock Holmes raising a magnifying glass to his eye and his, his ink. I can have a character with glasses and the glasses won't cost me any inclines. I, this is a very nice option to have. So I'm glad it's in there. So a benefit here is that you can, it's like you, you're drawing, but you're not drawing. You're modeling, you know, and. I'm modeling with my inking in mind. It, it, uh, and one, one more thing, like I want to show that it works on instancing as well. That it, what you do is you apply the edges to the object that's getting instanced. And in this case, I got all fancy, and I have a gradient that varies the color based on uh, the instance, like a fixed rant, uh, based on the instances themselves. So you look at it from here, and I've got instances, not, and they not only have ink lines, but they're, they've also got a, a varied color. I, I could probably just. So you just made one box, you inked it, randomized its color and then instance each instance is going to get the random coloring and inking as it uh, is applied to the instance generator yep so if I wanted to vary the if I, if I didn't make it such a harsh so here I've got more of a soft variety of colors again based on the instance ID there's a lot of options that you've got here. And one more thing I'd like to show is that it's not just the instances that respect this. I, I have, I'm using an advanced camera to give a spherical distortion to the scene. Now this will take a moment. Advanced camera is a, uh, but I'm using an extreme spherical distortion on the camera. And the reason I'm, uh, the I've reason. Yeah, I've seen shots like this, you know, uh, uh, flying high over the, the city as you're moving and seeing your, your hero or, or air, air fl airplane flying underneath. Yep. And the reason that I'm interested in this sort of thing is because let's say I had a shot where a character is looking through, looking through the, uh, the safety peephole and a door, and on the other end you see a character looking up with an extreme distortion. I can do that in this system because I, I have a camera that is capable of spherical distortion and the edges will respect the distortions of the camera. So I'm not limited to any specific camera. I can use any camera I want, and the edges, all the edges are doing is they're tracing lines, or they're tracing the wireframe of the geometry. The edges will respect that. So this is a nice option to have. So and it's bringing tools to the artist, making it where any concept that you have from concept to completion, yep. all the tools are there, including if that vision is a cartoon. Yep. So I'd like to also like to show, uh, this is an example of flocking and instancing. And it is a tutorial that is present in the Lightwave magazine. You can like read through it step by step to see how it was accomplished. But it shows off a lot of nice features. It shows off that not only flocking and instancing, but also shows how it's only one airplane. There's just one airplane in the scene. The surface is changing. The surface is changing. Now, this is a complicated version of it, but the surface is changing based on, based on the, uh, the ID of the object. Oops, the, uh, based, or sorry, based on the ID of the instance. That's right, right here. So this gradient is driving all the surface properties like based on where that random number, a ran the fixed random mean, gives you a random value between zero and one for every instance present in the scene. So I've, from zero to one, I've got all these random colors. 
And what's kind of spiffy about the node editor is that you can expose some of those keys. If you turn show output turned on, then the key gets exposed and you can override that color with a texture. If you, then that's really useful because that so means- So that's how you're getting the ones that have stripes. Right, the striped ones, it's a checkerboard texture respecting, it's a 2D checkerboard texture respecting the UVs of the object. And just on a certain, on the two uh, types of instances, they're getting this particular texture. That also applies to the, to the edges. Let's see here, let's go to the paper airplane, go to its edges, I've got, and here's what I've got driving the edges in here uh, to give it a sort of, the, what this one is, is I've got a, a layer-based texture editor, the distance to camera in it what, it, what it's doing is, it's enveloping out so the edges get thinner with distance. This is an aesthetic choice on my part. I don't want the things turning into little, you can have uniformly sized edges with distance if you want, and that might be more representative if you've, if you've always got like the same, like, uh, the same millimeter size technical pen, that's probably what you'd get in real life. But visually... So what you're, what you're doing is you're making things that are further away from the camera have a lighter line, that's, and things that are closer to the camera have a heavier line. That's what this is. This is to give it sort of a, 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 a vary the width so it doesn't look perfect. I, it's funny, it's like computers No, no always, artist is perfect, right? Well, computers always make things perfect. Right. But humans but don't. Humans are imperfect. We're so wanting to make that human element yes. so that it looks like it was actually hand drawn. So I'm using fixed random into this gradient, and what it's and this is what it's doing is it's, uh, it's also randomizing the color of the edges. Now in Disney, what they would do with their paints was it, they had something called a self ink line, and what the artists tried to do was they tried to match because the inks went on top of the cell, and the paint went on the back of the cell, and the cell was transparent and sort of darkened and grayed out the, the, the paint on the back of the cell. They really tried to make those lines invisible on the top. So what they would do is they darken and gray out the ink that went on top. And that's what I'm trying to do here with the color tool node to darken, to darken the, uh, the, the inks a bit and also to desaturate them just a little bit to try to give them that sort of self ink property that the classic Disney cartoons had like Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty being one of like- So it seems like paint. really a, a lot of thought has been gone into how to how to simulate how to recreate some of these techniques and artistic things that have been generated by hand for so long yeah the level of control that you need is there all that all that you need to accompany it would be your own knowledge what you bring to the table and in this case uh, i recommend whenever possible using a hand drawn sh model sheet because Notice that this does not look like a photorealistic human head. The proportions are totally different, but what it does do is it I don't know, I think she lives next door to me. Well, what it does is if, if your geometry traces perfectly fits the original ink lines of the model sheet, if you've got that, then the lines themselves, the lines themselves which are, which are selective wireframes, they too will, will uh, respect will follow that line, follow that contour. So you can't, this is why you can't take a poser model that was meant for photorealistic representation, slap a cell shader on it and wonder why it looks posterized. It's not gonna happen. You, it has to be a stylized piece of geometry. The, you have to have a stylized piece of geometry in order to get this stylized render. Just like realistic has to be realistic, stylized needs to be stylized. Yep. And uh, what I'd like to show here, and this is a, a cute little trick, I'm using the same, the same method that I used for the shading on the surface is what I'm using to make the ink lines have separate colors. There was a 2003 cartoon called Wonderful Days. It also went by the name Sky Blue, and this was made in 2003. And what this piece did was, I've never seen this before or since, but the ink lines themselves were shaded. And in order to recreate that look in Lightwave a little bit, like what I, I, I don't have the harsh like start stop that they did, where they would have like a bright, they would have a bright look and then all of a sudden a dark look. I didn't, I didn't do that for sex reasons. But the way you do that in Lightwave, the way you get that look, you throw a Lambert diffuse node in there. And what this represents is the light in the scene. So wherever the object is lit by light, it'll return, it's gonna return white Wherever there is no light because it's under shadow, it's gonna return black. 
And I'm using that as the input on this gradient node. So I see what you're talking about. You're talking about there on the hair, the ink on the top where you've got the lighting is hitting, it's white or kind of a lighter pink. And as it gets into the shadow, it goes to a darker pink. This one does have a harsh stop start to it. You can see it in the gradient. You can see it in the render. It's the skin. It's a skin and the body that do not, ha they have a softer, they have a softer approach. And let's go to the, the body. Let's see here. So this was what this was the gradient I used on the body, and you can tell where it goes from light to dark. You can tell right there. It's kind of fun to just play around with the software and just see what you, kind of stuff you can get. I'm also using different methods to vary the thickness on this model. I'm using a weight map value to to fit. This is how you. This is how the drawings work. Where, in the example of the chin. Example of the chin. If you were to draw this in real in real life, there's actual uh, drawing books that like give tips where they say for corners, try to lift up the pen so that you don't you don't use the same very very uh, the same width for everything. For corners like the tip of the nose or the tip of the chin, try to fade it out to nothing. And I do that with with this weight map on this character so that it's it's a val weight value of zero here. And that's fed into the taper, and that makes it go to nothing at the chin. I've got something similar going on for the tip of the nose. You can see that she's got very thick inclines, except for the tip of the nose, the tip of the chin. And this is all controlled by weight maps. Let me take the, the color off so it's all solid, a solid incline. Now it looks more like the incline's on, like Attack on Titan. <laughs> but that's a, a very, that's an example of just being able to taper taper the lines. You didn't have that before 11.5, but now you do. You have the option to taper inclines. So it looks like we've really, with 11.5, added in uh, really all the things, most everything, that you really need to have in order to start pulling off maybe doing your own, your own anime or your own uh, stylistic animations, so long as you follow Follow the rules, follow the simple rules, model for that need, and uh, pay attention to how the edges are going to be handled once you get it into the render. Oh, this looks fun. Yeah, this one's actually really simple. This one's an emitter, just an emitter of particles going up. So that, that's all it is. I've got, just got an emitter of particles going up. We've had particle emitters for the longest time in Lightwave. And instancing got added in 11, that native to Lightwave. So I've got. I've got these balls in the, in the node editor for the instances. It's a sphere. It's a sphere of geometry. And what I'm doing is add, it's going through a world coordinate texture that makes it stretch on its y-axis. I had to do something similar for a commercial, for a commercial motion theory. Bubbles, that is. So this is one bubble, one model, that's and in surfaced and instanced onto the particles what using... I really Yep, and what I really love about it is the way it's showing off that you can see it right here. The inclines are reflecting and refracting in each other. This is a very nice example of that because if you had to draw this by hand, oh. I've seen, I'll bet you Richard Williams could do it. I'll bet you that man could do it. If anyone could do it, like, there are some incredible people who can do this kind of stuff. And that's a really wild example. Yeah, if you, but if you're an ordinary mortal, I'd use rather, light wave. Yeah, <laughs> use light wave. Just uh, do it this way. So this is, uh, and this is this is pretty simple. It's just a ball, instancing, particle emitter, and oh, also, uh, all the content I showed you today, it's part of the 11.5 content. So it's if you. you if so you're it's a, there. Yeah, if you're a light wave user, you can get this. You can download this from your user account, and you can open it up for further study. What you have to do, though, is you have to make sure that you're registered at lightwave3d.com. Yes. Make, and check your account and check under the, under the uh, content that ships with Lightwave. And you'll be able to download this content and break it down and, and learn from example. I always learn from example better, I think. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is an example of some of the neat tricks that you can do with Lightwave 11.5 inking.